I want to talk to you about a very special case of mine. In fact, it's a series of cases, something that I've spent a lot of time on in my career. This is Contra Costa County back in the 1970s, and there was a strange phenomenon going on pretty much throughout Northern California where there were active serial predators attacking in clusters in the 1970s, and then they stopped once the 1980s hit. And I got involved in looking at a bunch of unsolved cases in my jurisdiction, trying to see well, what was going on. Many of these cases were in affluent areas, yet there was many unsolved cases of women, as well as younger girls, that were occurring at a rapid pace. So I decided to dig into these cases, and in particular, I focused in on a series of cases that appeared to be occurring in the small town of Moraga. 1972, 19-year-old Maureen Fields is working up in Pleasant Hill at a Kmart. She's going to get off work roughly 5 o'clock. Her dad is running late. He gets there. She doesn't come out of the store. She doesn't show up that evening. The next day, her father receives a call at his home in Moraga. And the male voice on the other end of the phone tells him, I have killed your daughter. And then her body is found. And it's been dumped off the side of Morgan Territory Road, which is at the base of the east side of Mount Diablo. She's nude and she's significantly decomposed. The investigation proceeds, but ultimately it goes cold. Nobody knows what happened to Maureen. Two years later, 15-year-old Lisa Beery is at her house in the Montclair area of the eastern part of Oakland, up in the hills. And her mom asks her to go cash a check at the nearby convenience store. Lisa grabs that check, leaves the house. She never comes home. She goes missing. The family has no idea where Lisa is at. And that case goes cold. And then a year after that, 1975, in Walnut Creek, we have 25-year-old Letitia Fago, husband, is a traveling salesman. He leaves in the morning. It appears Letitia was taking a shower, and as soon as she gets out of the shower, she's attacked. She's been hit on the head, she's been strangled, she's been raped. And this case goes cold. When you think of these three cases, would anybody naturally link those three cases as having been committed by the same offender? 1979, a woman walks into Oakland PD. And this woman, who is separated from her husband and is now dating a police officer in a nearby jurisdiction, says she is aware that her soon-to-be ex-husband has been involved with three homicides. This woman, Sue, in fact, starts to recount how she was involved in assisting her husband in those three homicides. And guess which homicides they were? Maureen Fields, Lisa Beery, and Letitia Fago. Sue starts to talk about she's living in Moraga with her husband, Phil Hughes. Phil comes home at night, says he's driving through Moraga and saw this man chasing and stabbing a woman. He stops, get out, gets out of his car, and chases after this man. The man runs off, and he comes up to this body of this woman who's still alive, but she's been stabbed multiple times. And Phil claims that she begs him to kill her, to put her out of her misery. So Phil obliges. So now he's showing up at home and is telling Sue 
hey, this is what I saw, this is what I did. I now have this body out in this field. We need to get rid of that body. So Sue and Phil go drive and pick up Maureen Field's body. And they drive out to Morgan Territory Road where Phil removes Maureen's body from the trunk and dumps it down off the side of the road into a creek. He then proceeds to take her clothes and dumps those. Taking time to wipe her patent leather shoes to make sure there was no fingerprints on them. So back in 1972, fingerprints were the way to identify an offender. And Phil, savvy about evidence, is taking the time to get rid of the evidence of his presence. Two years later, Sue tells the homicide detective for Oakland PD, Alex Smith, a man that I've met and unfortunately has since passed away, but she tells Detective Smith that her and Phil are house-sitting for a couple that they know in the Montclair area where Lisa Beery went missing. They're driving around. Sue's driving, Phil's in the front passenger seat, and they see Lisa Beery, who was going to the convenience store to cash a check, but she's hitchhiking. So Phil tells Sue, pull over. Phil gets out, grabs Lisa, he's got a knife in his hand, and forces Lisa into the car, into the rear seat, and tells Sue, go back to the house. They get to the house, they go into the house. Phil has got Lisa at knife point. He tells Sue, keep the dogs upstairs, and he takes Lisa down to the basement. About an hour later, Phil comes up. He's nude and he's covered in blood. Tell Sue, I need help. Sue goes down into the basement, sees Lisa laying on her back, nude. She's been stabbed in the chest and her throat has been cut. They both take Lisa's body and wash it in the shower and then put Lisa into a sleeping bag and into the trunk of the car. They clean up the house and for several days, they're driving around with Lisa's body in their car trying to figure out what to do with her. And then Phil comes up with an idea. And in the middle of the night, in the middle of Moraga, Phil drives up Donald Drive onto a hill, has Sue pull over. He gets out, grabs Lisa's body and a shovel, and Sue drives off. Phil goes down the side off the road, and a little while later, Sue comes back, and Phil is there with a shovel standing on the side of the road, Lisa having been buried. A year goes by. And now Phil approaches Sue and is saying, I've got the urge again. I need to kill somebody. In fact, I need to kill somebody that looks like my former girlfriend, Kathy. So Sue, who worked at a bank downtown San Francisco, starts listing off her coworkers and describing their physical characteristics. One of those coworkers is Letitia Fago. Phil and Sue go to the local BART station, and Phil sees Letitia get off the BART train and says, she'll do. So Phil now goes over to the Fago residence, and he had insider information from Sue that Letitia's husband was going to be away. And so he waits. When Mr. Fago leaves, he goes into the Fago residence and ends up killing Letitia. So Phil, of course, is arrested, and he is convicted of those three homicides, Maureen Fields, Lisa Beery, Letitia Fago. As I'm digging into all of these unsolved cases, one of the phenomena that I, I saw as I was going through is that once Phil was convicted, investigations to the other unsolved cases stopped. 
because law enforcement assumed Phil Hughes was responsible for all of them. I decided with modern technology, and now this is in the late 1990s, so it's not modern relative to today, but at this point in time, DNA was starting. I thought, well, you know what? Let's try to solve all these cases and show that Phil was, in fact, responsible for all of them. One of the most maddening aspects about this is that Phil, even though he has three sexually motivated homicides that he was convicted of, he was sentenced to seven years to life. He became eligible for parole starting in 1986. And I thought, no, oh, that's not right. There's just no way this man should ever be allowed back out in society. So my goal was to try to find some of these unsolved cases that were death penalty eligible and prove that Phil was responsible and then be able to hang that death penalty over him to get him to admit to everything that he's done because he's done more than those three. Now, what I thought was possibly the most promising case was a case that occurred 1978 at the Lafayette Reservoir. And in California, the death penalty had been suspended, for lack of a, a better descriptor, in the 1970s due to what we refer to as the Roseburg decision, Judge Roseburg. And so all these guys that were on death row had their death sentences commuted. And so if an offender had committed an attack that formerly would have been death eligible prior to the Ro after the Roseburg decision, they're no longer eligible to receive the death penalty. So I'm looking at this list of all these cases that potentially Phil Hughes could be involved with. And now I'm having to factor in, when did the death penalty get reinstated? And there were two cases that I'm going to highlight right now uh, in which would be death eligible. And so I focused in on this um, housewife out of Lafayette. She had gone out jogging around the reservoir and then she fails to come home. And this is Armida Wiltsey. When she fails to come home, husband comes home, says, where's my wife? Huge search of the reservoir occurs and then Armida has been found, pulled off the jogging path into the bushes. She is found nude from the waist down. There's evidence that her wrists had been bound, but the bindings have been removed by the offender. And earrings out of her right ear were, were missing. And from my perspective, entirely possible that the offender took that earring as a souvenir. Now, during a struggle, as you could imagine being in the, uh, the, the bushes, if that earring fell off and having processed scenes like this, it is hard to find something small like that in this type of vegetation. So is it possible it fell off? Yes, but I also think it's possible the offender took, took a souvenir. So I'm marching down and looking at all this evidence from the Armida Wiltsey case. Underneath her fingernail is a tiny brownish red smear. And it can hardly be seen in this magnified photograph. And to give you a sense about how small this stain was, the ruler in the bottom part of the photograph, in between just two, you know, two consecutive lines, that's one millimeter. And this stain was smaller than one millimeter wide and was just a sliver. It's turned out to test positive for blood. And a male DNA profile was developed from this tiny, tiny blood stain back in the early 2000s. So yes, you know, got physical evidence. This possibly is the offender's blood underneath the fingernail. He got scratched, and I'm going to be able to close this case on Phil Hughes. 
And so I go and I have to get a DNA standard from Phil. And some had been collected back in 1979. His blood had been collected back in 1979 and been entered into court as evidence. And so now I'm writing an affidavit in order to get Phil's DNA profile and show that that's his blood underneath our meat and Wiltsy's fingernail. Things didn't go as planned. And one of the things I should tell everybody is that I do have an Audible original coming out sometime this year. I'm being told right now around July of this year. And I'm going to go into much greater detail on this series of cases in addition to what is going on in the Armida Wiltsey case. Well, Armida Wiltsey didn't pan out as being the case that would be death eligible to put on to Phil Hughes. So what was another case? So we can see in this image, I've got highlighting Maureen Field and Lisa Beery in the surrounding Moraga. Armida Wiltsey was just right over the hill from where this photograph was taken. And then down in the lower left-hand side, same year as Armida Wiltsey, it's a homicide of Cynthia Waxman. Another death penalty eligible case, at least on when she was killed. This is a sad case. Cynthia goes to Camp Alinda High School on a Saturday morning with her cousin's family. Her One of her cousins is playing baseball on the field, and then her um, other cousin, Stephanie, and Cynthia decide they're going to play. And they had seen a kitten out on the main road. And they go and track down that kitten. And as they're playing and petting with this, this cat, they realize this cat's probably hungry. And so Stephanie, who's a year older than Cynthia, goes back to the baseball field to ask her dad for some money so they can go buy some cat food. When Stephanie comes back to where she had left Cynthia with the kitten, Cynthia is not there. And Stephanie hears what she thinks sounds like two male voices back in the bushes and gets a little scared. And she goes back to her dad and says, Cynthia's missing. And her dad's like, no, probably has just walked home because Cynthia literally lived in the neighborhood right across the street from the high school. So the baseball game is finished. The family, the cousin's family, go back, goes back. And the dad checks in with Cynthia's mom. And Cynthia's mom is like, Cynthia's not home. Cynthia's mom goes and looks for her daughter. And she finds her daughter's body that's been pulled back into the bushes. So we can see from this aerial photograph, the slide, the upper right-hand part is, you see the, the, the yard for the school buses, and then Camp Alindo High School and the baseball fields were back there. And then where Cynthia's body was found was in these bushes. She's laying on her back, and she's been, her hands are bound in front of her with this nylon rope. And with another section of the very same nylon rope, she's been strangled. The source of the nylon rope was on this old barbed wire fence that was further back into the bushes. And it had been, the, the sections of the rope had been made by the offender using a lighter and burning through the nylon rope. And he came prepared after getting the rope from the barbed wire fence, he made two lengths. And he ends up binding Cynthia's wrist and using the other as, as a ligature. And I believe that the offender in this case saw the two girls playing by themselves. And that's why he made two lengths of rope. And then when he gets to where the girls are, there's only one girl, Cynthia. You take a look at where Cynthia was killed relative to where Reen Valley Bowl is, where Phil hung out all the time. This bona fide serial killer is driving along past where Cynthia was found day in and day out. This has got to be a Phil Hughes case, or so I thought. 
And again, that's another case that did not go as planned. More details will be in my Audible original, but this series of cases and my efforts to dig into these unsolved cases and then also working with other investigators who contributed mightily became apparent that there was a lot more going on in Contra Costa County than just Phil Hughes. And in part, because of DNA technology, being able to answer some of the questions as to what was going on. And it's very interesting. In this picture, six of these cases have been solved. And of those six cases, four different serial killers are responsible. Yet, there are still unsolved cases, only some that are pictured here, such as Elaine Davis in December of 69, Cassette Ellison, who I'm going to talk about a little bit in March of 1970. Leona Roberts, December 69. Patricia King, March of 1970. These are unsolved cases. Is Phil responsible? Are some of these other known serial killers responsible? Are there other serial killers that we have yet to identify who are active in Contra Costa County in the 1970s? This is a passion case of mine. March 3rd, 1970, in Moraga. 15-year-old Cassette Ellison is a student at Camp Alindo High School. She gets on the school bus. School bus drives her down just south of the most southern part of the Moraga Town border where Cassette lived. She lived in a house that was about a quarter mile off the road in this East Bay mud uh, land. A very isolated house. Cassette goes missing. She never makes it home. Ten months later, her body is found off of Morgan Territory Road in the same creek that Maureen Fields' body ultimately was dumped by Phil Hughes two years later. I ended up reaching out to Cassette's sister, who sent me family photographs. <clears throat> you know, and this, and this is where I get attached. Because you see Cassette during life. And knowing what happened to her, her clothes had been recovered, and I saw what the offender did to her clothes. She should never have gone through that. A woman who's driving by after Cassette climbed over the gate sees Cassette talking to a man. And she's able to give a composite that we see on the right-hand side. And it's a man, she described as a reasonably attractive young man, wearing a fisher's hat. On the left-hand side, this is Phil Hughes, wearing a hat. And per a former girl acquaintance, female acquaintance of his, he wore this hat all the time. Now, I can't say Phil Hughes is responsible for cassette. But most certainly, considering this is in Moraga, this is where Phil is all the time, and there's a composite that looks very much like Phil, he's prime suspect in my opinion. And this is a case that I want to see solved above any others that I've worked. So with that, I do want to remind everybody that I go into much more detail about these series of cases in an Audible original that is tentatively just titled as Contra Costa. And I'm being told roughly around July of this year 
that it will be available.